you all for sticking around. And uh, I gave lots of uh, presentations. Um, but I'm nervous standing up next to Sandy because, you know, with that intro about all you've been through, um, it's humbling to stand up here with you and, and talk about uh, Scudder Derma. Um, thanks to you all for coming today. And thank you to Cindy and the foundation and all the volunteers who made this uh, day go smoothly. And um, what we're going to do is uh, I'm going to be a, a good listener, I think, for a while and let Sandy share maybe the patient perspective on how to build a medical team centered around an individual's care. Um, we'll make this interactive, right? So I'll try not to interrupt you too much, Sandy. Um, and, and as you all have questions, you know, best to just raise your hand and, and I think interrupt us rather than waiting until the end, okay? Hi, everyone. Hey. Hello. So I am not a doctor and I don't play one on TV. <laughs> um, I just put this together, um, you know, with the help of Dr. Fisher. Um, through my experience to kind of um, show you all of the um, ologists that I've termed. Sandy, put the mic closer to your mouth. Sure. Is that better? Yes. Uh, all the ologists uh, uh, that I've experienced going through my, you know, um, particular process of scleroderma. So um, I think it's really important that you participate in your health care and that you um, communicate with your doctors as much as possible. So there may be many specialists. You may be only seeing one doctor right now, but you may, in the future, need to see many more. So this is kind of a list of some of the different types of professionals that are involved, uh, could be involved in your scleroderma care. So we have the king, the um, rheumatologist. And um, this one I'm standing next to has been dubbed King Fisher, so. Um, they, he specializes in, or all rheumatologists should specialize in systemic autoimmune diseases. In the community, they mostly see um, some more common afflictions like RA and other diseases such as lupus and you know arthritis. You might spend a lot of time talking things over with your rheumatologist, a lot of time, and they will often be the main point of your management for scleroderma. Yeah, so I, mean, I would highlight that this is a really rare condition. Um, and it's really rare for rheumatologists. So when we do our training, um, we go to medical school, then we do a residency where we sort of choose between pediatrics, we hear from Dr. Moore, uh, we do adult medicine perhaps, like I chose. Um, other people you know, end up going into surgical specialties, etc. But So medical school, then you do an adult rheumatology, I'm sorry, internal medicine or pediatrics, and then we specialize after that. So let's say if you're mostly an adult audience, so the rheumatologist you'd see went to medical school, did general internal medicine for several years, and then specialized in rheumatology. In medical school, we may or may not encounter a patient with scleroderma. It just depends. You may or may not see one. Uh, in internal medicine, we spend most of our time in the hospital. We may or may not see a scleroderma patient. Then we do rheumatology. So primarily, rheumatology, depending on where you work, in, let's say academic institutions, you may see a ton of rheumatoid arthritis. You may see a fair bit of lupus. You'll see diseases that we call vasculitis. You see pain conditions. And every once in a while, a scleroderma patient will be on our schedule as we're doing our subspecialty training as a rheumatologist. And I trained here, and I would tell you I was completely um, overwhelmed and uh, inadequately exposed during my training to scleroderma as a rheumatology fellow. I don't know, if Katie, if you had a similar experience or
Yeah, so the point is, is that as we train in rheumatology, we're really taught to take care of rheumatoid arthritis. We're taught to take care of lupus and vasculitis. And depending on where you trained and whether you had a mentor that had a predilection for this disease, you may or may not see much of it. Why am I elaborating so much? Just to acknowledge that sometimes the patient knows a lot more you know, about what they're up against and, and they've been to support groups and they've come to days like today or sometimes rheumatologists aren't as comfortable with this disease. And I just, you know, it's a learning process. And I would tell you personally, I learned a lot more about scleroderma care just kind of on the job after I finished my fellowship seeing lots and lots of patients. It's not so much a disclaimer, it's just to give you a sense as to the rarity of your disease and, and that sometimes it takes a while to build a team with people who are comfortable taking care of a rare condition. I told you I wasn't gonna, wasn't gonna interrupt, right? Yeah. Yeah. Perfect. Um, so, of course, the rheumatologist is your first point of contact to be diagnosed, and um, hopefully you get a, a good one who has a plan, and, um, of course, there's, you know, the specialists that even if you're in a rural community and you cannot see a specialist all the time, that you could make an effort to see a specialist in, in uh, Scleroderma at least once a year to check in, get all the major tests, and see how you're doing. A lot of the all, other ologists that can be involved in your care, um, cardiologist, which of course is um, for the heart and specializes in heart blood vessels, they do the echoes, um, they might be involved if you have high blood pressure um, in your lungs like PAH, and uh, if you have systemic high blood pressure that's related to your kidneys. Uh, dentist, orthodontist, which we heard from today and how important that is. Uh, we've all experienced, maybe if you haven't, but I, I know I have experienced problems with dental care and um, ulcers in the mouth. A dermatologist, now in, in my case, a uh, dermatologist doesn't really come into play too much. Um, I don't have morphia, I don't have any of the skin conditions that come, you know, the skin itching, of course, with uh, the tightening, but a dermatologist isn't somebody who I see regularly, but you may have issues that need dermatology. So the dietitian or nutritionist, um, we heard from Michelle earlier, and she's amazing. She's got a lot of great ideas. She's done talks for us uh, on our virtual calls. And uh, I just put together a little bit of a, what a difference between a dietitian and a nutritionist is. Uh, there's registered dietitians. They have a degree um, and a bachelor's degree. And then there's a nutritionist who has a PhD. Uh, let's see. And so they've studied a little bit further. And so you can make your choice on who you see as far as that goes or who you're gonna to listen to or trust, as she says. I thought that was amazing the way she talked about how you're gonna trust your sources. An endocrinologist is somebody who focuses on the endocrine system. Um, in my case, I have seen an endocrinologist for the um, osteoporosis. It left me for a second. But. Um, for osteoporosis, who manages that care for me. Um, they will also manage glands, hormones, bone health, and uh, also, so Hashimoto's, I think, is one of them, diabetes. So if you have any of those issues, an endocrinologist is your ologist for that. The gastroenterologist is somebody that probably we should all see, as Dr. Fisher has told us before, that it's 90-some percent of us have GI issues. Whether we have the symptoms or not, um, things are happening. Good. Do you want to elaborate on that at all? Uh, you know, I think just highlighting, you know, with multi-system disease, you kind of need multi-system approach approaches. So if we are, let's say, a rheumatologist, um, we need to partner with other specialists. So for example, GI is an obvious one. Yeah, patients who have esophageal reflux disease, 
and then have a risk to their esophagus as a result and potential uh, complications from acid injury to the esophagus and so upper endoscopy right lots of hands right people have had upper endoscopy um, we need to partner with gastroenterologists in that regard um, it's really critical for all of these that the specialist knows about scleroderma um, so talking about cardiology for example so cardiologists really focus on left heart disease right heart disease is the number one killer in america and um, left heart disease is the focus of what primarily cardiologists will take care of sometimes it could be arrhythmias sometimes sometimes it's heart blockages sometimes it's the effects of high blood pressure on the heart, but it's always about the left side of the heart. But for those who have heard scleroderma presentations before, the right side of the heart is primarily involved when patients develop pulmonary hypertension. So if you're a patient seeing a cardiologist that is really focused almost exclusively on the left side of the heart, but you, as a scleroderma patient, need to be very mindful that it's the right side of your heart that is mostly at risk with pulmonary hypertension. You could see why that cardiologist might be caught a little bit off guard, right? So that's just one example of, oh, so you have a scleroderma patient that's going to a specialist. The question is, does that specialist recognize you know, this specific disease? And do they know specifically why this patient is being sent for their evaluation? So we struggle with this in rheumatology because if we take care of scleroderma, we want to screen for pulmonary hypertension, for example, which we all know that we need to do. A waiting room waiting to see a cardiologist or a waiting room waiting to see a pulmonologist, those patients who are there are not there for screening. They may already have heart disease, they may already have lung disease. So I've heard from my patients that, oh yeah, my cardiologist said, come back when you have chest pain. Or to the lung doc, come back when you're short of breath and need uh, you know, a lung doc. But no, because we're rheumatologists, so we get that we need to send our scleroderma patients to those doctors to be screened in advance of problems, right? So you can see that that's a real disconnect. Okay, so I think for the cardiology slide, you know, my point would be I want that cardiologist looking at the right side of the heart with their echocardiogram. And I want them focused on the fact that some of our scleroderma patients can have um, infiltration with scarring, what we call fibrosis, into the heart tissue itself. Right? This is not about heart blockage and arrhythmia per se that maybe is their bread and butter. This is the odd case that they're going to get for the month. And if we're not building a team that's interacting, we're not going to get the evaluation that we need. You know, this is wonderful for us, but how much do doctors get this kind of training? More scientific probably because you're talking about a rare disease. Some people may never see it in their whole practice, their whole lifetime, I would assume. There might be a few people that wouldn't. So it sounds like the job of you all in the medical field is to help all these different disciplines that have to be used by our family members or ourselves. You all need to be educating them. You. Agreed and fair <laughs> critique. And I will tell you that it's, um, it's appreciated that interdisciplinary engagement and communication, education, dialogue is really fundamental to this disease. There are certain diseases that really require that. Systemic lupus is one of them. Systemic sclerosis is for sure another. Okay, so moving on, we've got uh, the general practitioner or your family doctor. Um, you can't be running to your rheumatologist when you get a cold or a virus or you know, a urinary tract infection. So um, you do still need your primary care doctor. Uh, 
whether it be an osteopath, somebody who just specializes in family medicine, internal medicine or pediatrics, a PA uh, or a nurse practitioner can also be a primary care provider, although they most not likely will not manage your scleroderma care, they are necessary for the general health care issues. Uh, a hand surgeon or hand therapist, now um, of course this is probably going to be referred by your rheumatologist and uh, is going to be managing your hand care, range of motion, maybe prescribing um, physical therapy as well, um, managing digital ulcers, which is not very manageable, and uh, Raynaud's management, and then sometimes surgery or Botox injections. Let me ask you a question. Maybe just uh, getting us an understanding of the lay of the land here. Who with scleroderma uses their primary doctor for their primary care? Primary doctor. Who uses their rheumatologist for their primary care? I mean, a little bit of a mix. Sandy and I were talking um, just about, you know, this could be overwhelming for an internal medicine doctor, you know, for primary care to sometimes coordinate all this. And sometimes the rheumatologist plays that role. I don't know, is that like that in pediatrics? I don't know if you all heard that. Katie was saying that in the pediatric world, there's almost like a fear of, of some of the pediatric scleroderma patients. And so the pediatric practitioner uh, may kind of step away from a primary role and just defer to rheumatology. And I think it's like that in adult medicine to, to a certain extent. It speaks to the lack of comfort that primary providers may have. We in rheumatology, I think we, um, sometimes don't do as good of a job as we should as primary care providers. So I think if one were to ask, let's say a rheumatologist, I think we would want primary care to be primary care. Yeah. There's a hand up. In yes. my experience of having had a primary care doctor tell me that, oh, you don't want to have scleroderma. I don't believe that you have scleroderma. And moving on from that point, having to manage my care myself, it's up to us as patients to know as much as possible so that we can try to influence our providers until we find the correct provider. So if you've got, I mean, I believe that I do run a lot of things through the rheumatology and especially through my kidney transplant team before um, anything else, but there's always those annual exams that we have to get that really don't involve the rheumatologist. So don't forget those for your, um, you know, general care as well. Another question? Um, I had a gastroenterologist after I'd been diagnosed. I moved from Wyoming to Colorado, went to see the gastroenterologist and said I had scleroderma, and he says, no, you don't. And he hadn't even looked at my file. After I explained to him all my uh, uh, symptoms, he says, oh, maybe you do. But uh, my pulmonologist seems to have a better handle on the whole picture than any of my ologists. <laughs> there are good plumbers and bad plumbers. <laughs> okay, so uh, a hematologist may come into play, especially if you're dealing with some um, anemia, different kind of blood disorders. The uh, hematology specializes at a, in a, they are a key role in the research and treatment of blood clotting and bleeding disorders. I've recently been seeing one for some weird anemia and uh, inability to keep my iron levels up. Uh, immunologist is somebody who specializes in your body's defense system. Gosh, I'm tripping over my words. Um, in the immune system. And this can be for symptoms all over your body. 
there might be a focus in your blood results, lots of different um, blood tests that maybe somebody else wouldn't order. Uh, I'm not so sure that there's not a lot of crossover with the rheumatologist and the immunologist. I think that, you know, if your rheumatologist is pretty uh, a good plumber, then you'll be uh, given all the tests you need and maybe referred if you need to. Integrative medicine is the blending of complementary and alternative medicine. We call it CAM therapies. And uh, with conventional care for the prevention and treatment of health conditions in the pursuit of wellness. So it's a little bit out of the box. It's not the normal that you might see every day. It could be acupuncture, massage. There's an integrative, integrative medicine department here at the university. So um, it encompasses different therapies that are pretty amazing and uh, can really help out with your daily life. The nurse, the all-important nurse, uh, can help you with a range of symptoms. They can be your point of contact um, and kind of the liaison for your doctor. They can be a valuable source of practical advice on day-to-day -day living. Um, you can talk to them about medications and side effects and health tips. They might also help arrange some of your treatments or tests. They're uh, very important in, um, in the whole setting of care, especially uh, I've experienced that in the rheumatology office. I think we've got a great nurse and she's amazing. So uh, it's just kind of um, an, an in-between for your doctor, but, but they are very knowledgeable and really can help you, help guide you to the way that you need to go. Do you want to work on that? Yeah, I mean, I think um, it's definitely you know, the expression, it takes a village, you know, to care for, for certain conditions. It takes a village and, um, you know, to be a physician and, and have support from a team of nursing is just really essential. A, you know, we may want to get a specific medication and okay, great, but your insurance company won't approve it and who's going to spend 20 minutes on the phone trying to get a prior authorization and or fax in the forms for whatever forms you need and or provide a lot of disease education, right? So. We're running around, patient visits, time's up, we gotta go, we're already late, you know, we're traveling, whatever we're doing, and who's gonna spend an extra 20 minutes, a half hour, um, discussing symptoms, discussing conditions, discussing medications, discussing monitoring. Um, so I think for those of us who have valuable, you know, nursing support, we, you know, we're, we find them invaluable. There's just no way we can function without them. So, and I think as patients, I would imagine that's a really valuable resource for you all to be able to know that you can reach out. Um, sure, uh, I wish I could, you know, get, where is Fisher now? Like why, you know, why can't I get an appointment or what, why am I not getting a call back? But I think knowing that you have access to um, our valuable staff in a partnership in a transparent way, I think could really be helpful. That's a great word, partnership. Um, there's also palliative care, which is uh, it's a medical specialty focused on the relief of pain. It's not, end of, it's not exactly end of life care, so it, this is more of um, quality of life care. So focused on relief of pain, stress, other debilitating symptoms of your serious illness, and the goal is to improve quality of life for your family. Um, sometimes the nurse can help you with a palliative care or arrange it for you or give you the resources so that you can check that and see if you're a candidate. A pharmacist, this is really important to me. I, I think that having a good relationship with a pharmacist is, is key to help you um, with all the different things that happen with your medications, to coordinate, and uh, to go to with questions. Um, so hopefully you, you can get some kind of a relationship with a pharmacist. I think that, you know, it depends on the setting, but, um, you know, if you if you can develop that relationship, it's gonna be very helpful for you. I would just highlight, um, first of all, amazing to put pharmacists there, because as polypharmacy, as more medications are added, and I, I think as physicians, we're not really well uh, trained when it comes to, oh, when do I take this medication relative to that medication? Or 
what time of day is best for X, Y, or Z, or what are my drug-drug interactions? I think having a pharmacist that you trust and can consult with is a huge help. And then just to echo what Sandy said about palliative care, because a lot of times we lump <coughs> palliative care or link it to hospice, hospice being end of life. Palliative care has nothing to do with duration, anticipated mortality. It has to do with providing palliation, pain relief, symptom relief, relief of suffering. And it may be things like helping identify a quality of life issue in the home or helping deliver health care in the home with additional nursing support. So sometimes we say palliative care and maybe we don't introduce it well or we have preconceived notions that this means that my doctor is saying end of life. And no, we're not talking about end of life. We're talking about how can we ease suffering separate entirely from any kind of end of life mortality discussion. And I haven't found many people who with this disease, you know, don't benefit from a thought about palliation. So it's, a, it's an underutilized tool, I think, because there are some perhaps barriers in our understanding of what it means. Questions? Or are there, are there palliative doctors? Or how do you go about someone who needs this? So the question is, are there palliative doctors, or how do you go about implementing it, perhaps? So first of all, it's, it's a recognition from the physician side, taking care of a patient, that maybe there are some needs that, that could, you know, could be best addressed by a palliative care team. Oftentimes it's a nurse center team, but a lot of these programs will have a medical doctor who may oversee it. Sometimes it's the primary care or rheumatologist who has to sign you know, orders. But uh, it's, the, it's really a notion of, whether it's pain control, whether it's home uh, help with regards to activities of daily living. Um, sometimes it really is a lot about pain control. Uh, palliation can be an important part and has to be instituted usually by the care team that's already in place. Um, and then it's maybe a home visit or maybe to a dedicated clinic. It just depends on the environment. Are there any drugs in the pipeline that could possibly have a significant positive effect on scleroderma itself, or are you, Dr. Fisher, regulated to kind of a trial and error thing with other drugs that come out for higher populations? So, so the answer is yes and yes. So in the current arena, we tend to borrow from other rheumatic conditions and apply them to scleroderma specific organ manifestations. Dr. Moore, Katie talked about uh, tocilizumab, Actemra, which is a rheumatoid arthritis drug and it's being looked at as a skin drug with some effects, nothing tremendous, but some effects. Uh, Ac uh, Orencia, Abitacet, same idea. Rheumatoid arthritis drug, let's apply it to scleroderma skin. So that's going to continue to happen. We take drugs from other domains and try them. They get tried like that in multiple sclerosis. It's not like scleroderma is the only disease for, for which this happens. There's a lot of mechanistic similarity, and so there's scientific plausibility to say, let's try. These are not diabetes drugs or high blood pressure drugs. These are drugs that target the immune system, and sometimes similar underlying mechanisms would dictate try this over that. So we continue to do that. There are other drugs that are novel that are in the fibrosis family. And those are under investigation now. Two in particular, one, in, one is called nintenidib and one is called perfenidone. Those are novel antifibrotic drugs that are approved for a lung fibrosis condition and they're being looked at as skin and lung fibrosis drugs in scleroderma. There are other novel compounds that are in the cannabinoid family that also have anti-inflammatory and antifibrotic effects. Those are being studied. So there are lots of trials and investigational drugs in various stages of development. 
Are we months away from a major breakthrough in how we treat scleroderma? We're not. Uh, are we making progress? Yes, we are. Is it fast enough? No. Uh, but we're doing a lot of that, you know, applying different drugs from different domains and also trying novel stuff. Okay, so podiatrist. The podiatrist looks after your foot health, and you may not need to meet a podiatrist, but it's good to know that they're there. Um, you know, sometimes just even for orthotics, if you're having issues with your feet, uh, a lot of times with scleroderma, you lose the little fat pads on the bottom of your feet, and it gets pretty painful, so you can always go see a podiatrist and see if they've got suggestions. Physical and occupational therapy. Um, they strive to help people live as independently as possible. And the goal of physical therapy is to assist an individual with pain relief and restoring motion and mobility, as we know is restricted in scleroderma. So that's another one that needs to be referred mostly by the rheumatologist, but uh, any, you know. And of course, the pulmonologist is very important. Uh, specializes in the lungs, and they'll be interested in monitoring what's going on with your lungs. Hopefully you had a baseline to have everything compared to, and might order scans and some other tests to check how your lungs are working. Yeah, I'm sure this will is yeah, it's, it's, Again, it's one of those, it's the same comments I had about GI and cardiology. A lot of pulmonologists primarily take care of asthma, chronic cough, and emphysema may not be as familiar with lung fibrosis, may not be as familiar with pulmonary hypertension. Those are the two leading causes, ultimately, of scleroderma-related deaths. So it's a frightening statement, and I know you guys already know all that. The reality is, is that if you're a scleroderma patient, um, you always need to know where you are with regards to lung involvement. And if your lung doc takes care of asthma, chronic cough, and emphysema, and hasn't seen a scleroderma patient in 20 or 30 years, you know, I'm not so sure how helpful that pulmonologist may be. So it's always about recentering towards this unusual rare condition, systemic sclerosis, and then highlighting for lungs, we know we're worried about lung fibrosis and pulmonary hypertension. And so sometimes the pulmonary hypertension, that's a cardiologist, sometimes it's a pulmonary hypertension specializing pulmonologist, for, for general pulmonary care, sometimes it's not a pulmonologist. In, in our clinic here, it's actually me, because I focus on lung fibrosis. So um, in, in this scenario, scleroderma lung fibrosis is gonna come through your rheumatologist, because you know that's, that's the way it works here. And many other centers have similar experience if you're seeing a dedicated scleroderma provider. But it's always about those two questions, lung fibrosis and pulmonary hypertension. Okay, to get into the psychologist or psychiatrist and social worker. Um, I went ahead and put some definitions down here for you. These specialists help with your coping and the emotional trauma that comes along with the chronic disease. Um, a psychiatrist is a medical doctor with special training in the diagnosis and treatment of mental and emotional illness. A psychiatrist can prescribe medication, but they don't always do the counseling for the patient. A clinical psychologist uh, has a doctoral degree in psychology from an accredited designated program in psychology, and they are trained to make diagnosis and provide individual and group therapy. A clinical social worker uh, is a counselor with a master's degree in social work from an accredited graduate program, and they are trained to make diagnosis, provide individual and group counseling, and provide case management advocacy. They're usually found in a hospital setting. So we all know that there's that piece of um, our little puzzle that needs to be taken care of. And there's a lot of emotional and uh, other kinds of issues that we deal with on a daily basis. The nephrologist, we just heard from a great one, specializes in the kidneys and they will be able to investigate any symptoms you have related to urinating or your kidneys. Um, now that we know the warning signs to look for, for the scleroderma renal crisis, not everyone with scleroderma will need to see a nephrologist, but hopefully you are educated earlier on when you would need to and uh, know the signs. Okay. 
wound care, um, when you have some digital ulcers that um, it could be leg ulcers, lower extremity, fingers, and they're non-healing, uh, wound care can get involved and give you um, tips and management tools and let you know when they're getting out of control and need some intervention. So in addition to all of the medical professions we just professionals we just spoke about, there's some um, alternative or additional uh, specialists that can help you. A naturopath, which we heard from last year, which takes um, natural medicine, they are MDs, but they also um, use a little bit of natural medicine and, and try to look at the whole person. They have a little bit of a different approach. Uh, a personal trainer or coach can add to your repertoire of, of professionals to help you keep your physical health and your movement. Um, I always say with scleroderma, if you stop moving, you'll stop moving. Um, friends and family uh, for your support system. And uh, a support group, either in person or online. Or call me, I like to meet with people one-on-one. -on -one. I think it's, um, sometimes it's too intimidating to come to a group setting, so you can call, text, email, or I can meet with you over coffee. Uh, Spiritual support is always big for a lot of people. I know it is for me. And so it is definitely important, that no matter who you see, that um, you let them know what's changed since your last visit, or you know, let them know if something's brand new. Keep an open dialogue with your team, and hopefully they keep an open dialogue with each other um, in an effort to develop new treatment and diagnostic plans and protocols and participate in research collaborations that may be available to you. We have a list of those on our website, and I think that on the University Rheumatology page, there's also another list of current clinical trials that's always um, important to keep in mind. Yeah, so, you know, I think, Sandy, you, you, know, you bring the perspective of having lived with this disease, uh, having navigated and, you know, Built a team. I mean, I'll, I'll put you on the spot a little bit. I mean, like, how do you build a team? How do you build the team? Um, well, I guess in my case, I built it. Um, it just kind of happened one by one. It wasn't. Uh, I didn't go in saying, "Okay, I have a checklist, and these are all the, the people I need." Unfortunately, mine came up as new problems came up, um, so that's, this is why I was hoping that this would help you just to have an, an idea of who you need in your team. But to build a team, I'm not exactly sure how to answer that. I guess um, um, sometimes it's trial and error. If you, if you actually have been seeing a rheumatologist and you're not happy with their care or if you're seeing you know, um, a different kind of specialist and they're not, they're not listening or giving you what you need, then you, know, you can see another one. You can, you can get a second opinion. You can keep going until you're comfortable. And, if you, um, and that's how you, you build your own team instead of having somebody say, well, you have to see this person or this person. Because it, it, is, it is your care, and you drive the bus. Yeah. I always just tell people, just look for the best. Do your research, find the best person. It's not a disease to go around with. Just find the best. And you can tell them no. You can tell them no. So one thing I would say, you know, um, from a very biased point of view, uh -huh. so for this, for this disease, um, a, lot of pe a lot of people go to a specialty center to just get even just a once over. It doesn't have to be here. You can go to go to Johns Hopkins in Baltimore. Go to Stanford. You know, go to Michigan. Go to Houston. You know, these are all programs that we have a lot. We all know each other, and we're specialized centers in a rare condition. And and when when you have a rare disease, I just think it's important to maybe just do like a once over a check in with a person that this isn't rare. This is a rare, this is the most common disease that, that we see up on the seventh floor, you know, rheumatology clinic. Uh, this is just the most common autoimmune disease that we see up there. 
Um, and if you go to Johns Hopkins, this is what they see, and they see myositis. And if you go to Pittsburgh, they see a lot of this. And different programs see a lot of it. And that's not taking away in one sense at all from the practitioners that are out in the community saving lives every day of the week. It's just acknowledging, whoa, this is really rare. I'm just going to make a one time, if I can, to a program that this isn't rare. And maybe that's a once a year. Maybe it's once every couple of years. Maybe it's checking in about what research studies you all may or may not have. So I would just throw that out there. It's not convenient. It's not logistically feasible. Sometimes it's not financially reasonable. But I don't think we should shy away from that, that that is a goal. That we have every scleroderma patient in this country at some point goes to a specialty center to get a specialty evaluation for a really rare condition that could then guide the more practical, financially feasible, logistically doable local care plans. And ideally that should be in concert. And I get lots of referrals from other rheumatologists for scleroderma, okay? I get like no referrals for rheumatoid arthritis. And it's not because, oh, I don't know how to take care of rheumatoid arthritis. It just doesn't have that same unmet need. So we at programs like this, we expect that we're gonna see complexity, maybe more challenging, maybe more difficult scenarios, maybe more rare conditions. So I would say on your end, it's okay to say that you want to go to a specialty program to get an evaluation. And again, it doesn't have to be at the University of Colorado. I'm happy to give you 10, 15 other names of places that would be really ideal for a once over. That's one, I think, central point. Another point is, is that if you are a rheumatologist, you cannot take care of this disease without gastroenterology help at some point. You're, you're going to need a GI doc. You are going to maybe need a pulmonologist, maybe you're going to need a cardiologist, that just depends on their level of comfort of interpreting heart ultrasounds, breathing tests, and CAT scans. But recognize that as a rheumatologist, you will need help, you'll need primary care, you need nursing. So we get overwhelmed with the team that we have to work with. In terms of how to build the team, I don't know if there's like a perfect formula other than there must be dialogue. There must be communication right. and there must be interaction between the specialists, among the specialists. When I was first diagnosed, I was diagnosed by a rheumatologist who said, I believe you have scleroderma. I'm an RA specialist, but I can treat you. That didn't resonate with me. So I immediately um, started researching to find who I could see, and that's when I stumbled across the Scleroderma Foundation and went to the next support group, and they directed me here, which I was very fortunate to be here from the beginning of my care. So that's how I started with my team, was I said no to the first doctor. I wasn't going to be, you know, just part of the, you know, her, her her patients, but not her specialty. I just, that didn't work for me. So keep in mind your own personality, write down your questions, um, have somebody who's compatible and listens in all of your doctors and all of your care. I think that's really important. And ask for copies of your records, because in an era of lack of shared EMR, we don't always have an electronic medical record that you know, is shared amongst institutions between providers. And so, oh, I got an echocardiogram down at Littleton. Yeah, my doc told me it was okay. I, that to me means nothing. I have no confidence in that statement. I'm on the line for identifying if my patient with scleroderma has or doesn't have pulmonary hypertension. I don't want to hear that a left-sided heart doctor told me that an echocardiogram done a little thing and I'm just picking on that institution for no good reason, uh, you know, told me that the echo looked okay. No, I want to see the report, show me the study, right? So that unfortunately falls on you all. And that's not fair, but it's true, you know? Oh, I went to see my kidney doc and everything looked fine. Okay, what, what was the actual report? And the GI doc said everything was fine. Great, can we please, you know, so I just think, being your own advocate, obviously, is going to be very helpful. And 
having managed my own care for years, I've learned that, that if I had to have all of these records, I have to compile everything. And with, you know, with electronic records, it's becoming much easier, but I no longer accept from a doctor, oh, this test was normal. No, I, I don't accept normal. Give me the results. I'm just sort of wondering, kind of in keeping with, with that idea that, you know, a specialist in cardiology may not be terribly useful, like either does the Scleroderma Foundation or the, the group here, or any groups that you know of, sort of compile you know, lists of doctors, let's say, where it's like, hey, if you're looking for, you know, such and such specialty, here's a group of names that have been kind of useful and that sort of a little bit more familiarity with, with the disease in general population. That's a great question. question. I mean, just to repeat it, basically, you know, just let our foundation provide a list or a resource, you know, to, for patients. And I don't actually know the answer. I mean, I know I have um, an answer, but I want to hear the right answer. Well, I know the answer, but Dr. Fisher doesn't know. Um, if you go to our website, Scleroderma Foundation, that, or just Scleroderma.org, and go to um, patients and newly diagnosed, um, it will take you to a page that lists all these scleroderma clinics around the country that have been. Um, listed as scleroderma clinics because they've gone through all kinds of um, analysis with our foundation to make sure that they have the expertise to treat patients and that they're involved in um, advancing research. So those are all listed on the website. At the chapter level, we also have a list of um, doctors. Our number one choice is usually the doctors at UC Health. But if, you know, if there's a discussion at a support group meeting and somebody tells me, oh, I love my rheumatologist, I see this podiatrist, I go to this PT person, and they like them, we'll add them to our list. That doesn't make them an expert, but if a patient is comfortable with them, we're happy to give that name to somebody else. 